Hi, John. <clears throat> hi, Mike. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. And hi, Joanne. Good morning. Good morning. Here are you both great. See that there's some folks at TBS getting us set up there. Hi, Steve. Hey, good morning. Good morning. How's everything going over there? Good. Sitting here on campus at Gonzaga, figured I'd use their internet for this. Blurry. Is, yeah, <laughs> is the mic, is my mic okay? You sound great. Yes. Thanks for popping in a little early, you two. Yes, I've done this and I know how important it is to know people are with you. Yeah. So Steve, are you giving a little opening um, spiel? Yeah, I will give a short little opening welcome and then turn it over to Rabbi. I promise not to take the whole hour. <laughs> That's good. It, it would be. I really appreciate you all being here and doing this. This is just terrific. So. Oh, yeah. Thanks for having us. This is a good conversation to have. It's important. Yeah, I agree. Totally. And I get to meet all these people. That's really, that's the best part of this. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi, Scott. Hi. Hi, Emily. Hi, good to see you. So Kiantha was having trouble getting in. It looks like she's in the waiting room. She's in the waiting room, good. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Michael. Oh, you bet. No, uh, there's Joanne sitting at home. Oh, and you need to be muted off screen. <laughs> We just have the panelists in right now. It's not a panelist. You're not a panelist. We could probably put it back in the waiting room. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. He's a member of our task force. Oh. <laughs> That's great. Happy to have him. He's in California and he wants to be sure to be here everything. Yeah. See ya. Kiantha, can you hear us? There you are. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Sorry for the tech difficulties. So the order of operations, if I understand, is Rabbi first, then or Steve, then Rabbi, then me. I think that's the plan. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Okay, that was we were we were a little worried about that. You know, we we thought we redid it yesterday, but anyway, um, good. I'm glad you can hear me. Yes, that's the plan. That um, Steve, then me, then I'm turning it over to Mike, and then Diana, you're. We fixed it. Can we hold oh, folks good. in the waiting okay. room until we're ready to start. Okay. This will be the schedule. Yeah, Eric, can we put folks in the waiting room? I can start putting people in the waiting room. Yeah. What do you want us to do? We're not ready to start. We just need to talk to the panelists first. So if we could have oh, just the uh -oh. waiting room. Okay. Everybody's in already. I'm sorry. I can remove them. Yeah. Okay. We have our technician here. She will take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's recording. And look on the panelist. Okay, the rest of them 
Can so see what we're going to do is spotlight for everyone when they're talking. Yeah. So it's going to be. Okay, it's only you now. So you can talk if you want. Yeah, look on the order. So for the panelists, my, my thinking, as I sent out in the um, agenda, uh, that I have some names there um, kind of for the folks that I'll turn to first on each um, question. Um, and then, you know, depending on timing, hopefully uh, with each theme, we'll have a chance to kind of open it up and let others chime in. If you are feeling like you uh, really want to jump in, um, you could raise your hand or just either using the Zoom hand raise function or just try to like flag my eye and I'll make sure to try to turn to you next. But I also have for myself kind of like time limits for each section um, because it feels like we should have some time for um, Q and A at the end from our attendees. Does that feel right? So maybe when in doubt, uh, I'll try to keep things moving to, to make sure there's time for that. And if we have too much time at the end, we can always just open it up to all of us. And if, if any of you have other things that were on your mind that you didn't get to say, then that could be a, a time to do that at the end as well. Do you I want to like questions coming through the chat or through verbal both? When we go to, um, when we go to questions, um, I suppose if there are, I would be happy to take, I don't know, does anybody else have an instinct about that? It could be, the problem, yeah. the challenge with verbal questions is that they, you know, you don't know what you're getting until they start talking. Um, I think chat is usually the way it's done. Yeah. For a large group. Mm -hmm. And I was you wondering, are you going to tell people to put their view on speaker? Yeah, so hi, it's Iris. Um, so what we will do basically, oh, now you can see me even. <laughs> um, so what we will do actually is we will spotlight all of you for the rest of the program, right? So when you speak, you will be, all, and actually you will be all the time on the spotlight. Now regarding question, Mike, uh, in the past, we did it only on the chat, but if you want to open open mic, we can do that as well, but then it's messy. Yeah, let's stick with the chat. Um, and then I can kind of look through the questions and, and um, grab ones that feel maybe um, useful. Yeah, good. And if you need in any point <clears throat> help uh, kind of review the chat, just send me a text message. Okay. And should we, are we gonna like pin all of the panelists? Yes, somehow? yes. I'll spotlight whoever. Like, this is Natalie. Hi, Natalie. <laughs> Steve's talking first, so I'll spotlight Steve initially. And then I'll make sure everyone's spotlighted when they're talking and yeah, meant. Yeah, but during the, during the panel- the, They're all gonna be spotlighted. You will, all, all the panelists and Mike will be spotlighted and not like Steve and Diana and so on. Mm -hmm. Okay, any other question? Because people want to get in, so can I admit everybody in? Sure. Perfect, thank you. Thank you all for being here. You bet.
Right. Correct. And I, and yeah. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate all that. That's wonderful. And, you Everyone know, please if, mute themselves. for any reason at any point, um, I made progress with my mental health. <clears throat> Yes, uh, we assume uh, the guest in person. And I will ask, first of all, everybody, if you can mute yourself, because we really want to hear our panelists today and not the dog barking in the background. So if you can mute yourself and Steve Silverstein, you have the stage. Thank you. And good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm Steve Silverstein, president of the board. A cup of best shalom. Am I unmuted? <clears throat> I'm pleased to welcome you to all to this program, a part of the Temple Best Shalom Lifelong Learning Series, programs that Temple Best Shalom hosts during the year to bring important topics to our community. I'd like to quote Dr. Martin Luther King to get started. My people, were brought to America in chains. Your people were driven here to escape the chains fashioned for them in Europe. Our unity is born of a common struggle for centuries, not only to rid ourselves of bondage, but to make oppression of any people by others an impossibility. Last summer, Zerus and I were discussing programming for our lifelong learning series. We noted that February is Black History Month. Social justice is a critical part of Jewish ethics. And in these trying times, what better way to expand our conversations than to invite our friends and neighbors in the greater community to an inclusive panel discussion. As Dr. King alludes, we have many things to share. This is what bonds us. We have many differences as well. Diversity is what will strengthen us. I have grandchildren of Jewish Ashkenazi American, Chinese American, and Jamaican Black American descent. My brother has grandchildren of Ashkenazi American, Filipino American, European American, Chinese Chinese, and Puerto Rican American descent. Diversity is our future. I'm grateful for this conversation. I'm grateful for Temple Beth Shalom, Education Director Iris Bernstein, Neil Schindler of Spokane Area Family Jewish Services, Diana Corkanian Saunders and Congregation Emmanuel. I'm grateful to the members of the panel and especially Dr. Michael Delon, who worked so hard to get this thing going. And I'm grateful to all the communities and you, the audience, 
I'm grateful to you all who are being here to engage in this dialogue. It's just the beginning of a dialogue. I'm hopeful that this will be a lifelong learning that brings a better future for my grandchildren, your children, and all our children, but children, a future our children need and deserve. And thank you and welcome. And Rabbi, would you please lead us? Sure. So I, I am not going to echo all of the beautifully eloquent things that you just said, Steve, and instead contextualize us in this moment that despite all of the brokenness in the world and all of the challenges that we uh, that we face as, uh, as diverse communities, as Jewish communities and as African-American communities. I am so grateful that we are able to be together this morning and have this conversation and continuing it, continue it in the future. So for those of you for whom this blessing is familiar, please join me, it's a blessing for special occasions. And for those of you for whom it's not familiar, if you, if you feel comfortable, you can join me in responding, amen. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Shehechianu vekimanu vehikmanu Hazman hauzeh Blessed are you Adonai, our God, sovereign of all, for giving us life, for sustaining us, and for enabling us to reach this very moment. Thank you. And I'm going to now turn it over to Mike Deland, who will formally introduce all of our panelists and lead us into our discussion this morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me, Iris. Thank you for inviting me to um, moderate this panel of really distinguished guests and experts. I'm really excited to be, to be part of this. Um, and it's been wonderful setting this up and just excited to participate. So um, in preparation for this panel, um, I turned to a book on my bookshelf called Black Spokane, The Civil Rights Struggle in the Inland Northwest by historian Dwayne Mack. Um, and one of the things that I was reading in one of the chapters um, was his description of black servicemen coming back from World War II in the 1940s, coming back to the inland Northwest and sort of realizing that they'd done all of this um, tremendous work fighting racism and oppression and anti-Semitism abroad and coming back to the inland Northwest and um, realizing that they were uh, once again, second class citizens. And so in, in the 1940s in Spokane, there was a real push um, for racial justice um, initiatives. And I was heartened um, by one of his descriptions to read that um, Rabbi A.H. Fink in 1944 in Spokane um, was one of the founding members of um, SCRR, which is the Spokane Committee for um, Race Relations. Um, and that group did a whole bunch of things. Um, they were involved in legislating racial discrimination cases. They also pushed for housing justice and equal access to healthcare um, and all kinds of the systemic issues that we know plague racial minorities in our city and our, and our country. Um, I wasn't totally surprised to realize that a rabbi was at the front of that movement. I mean, I think racial justice is a part of tikkun olam healing the world um, and Jews have a long history of participating in, in those movements. Um, but also I think at this moment in history of racial reckoning in our country over the last couple of years, it's, it's also time to, to sort of look in the mirror and ask if we're doing enough to be allies to um, other communities facing racial oppression. Um, and so uh, I'm just really happy to introduce our kind of diverse expert panel of experts on these questions of the kind of connections between anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism, but also the tremendous differences that um, our communities have uh, faced in this country. Um, so I'm going to introduce everyone briefly, and then I'm going to give each of the panelists a chance to say just a little bit more about who they are and how they arrived at these questions and these issues. Um, so we have with us today, Professor Joan Braun, who's a philosopher and faculty at um, Gonzaga's School of Leadership Studies, but also very involved in the Institute of Hate Studies, a kind of expert on um, extremist political ideologies, among other things. We have uh, with us Professor Scott Finney, who is the program director and faculty at Eastern Washington University's Africana Studies Department. We have Kiantha Duncan with us, who is the president of Spokane's chapter of the NAACP. 
Emily Kaufman is here. She works for the Anti-Defamation League and specifically their Center on Extremism. And she's located in Seattle and has done a lot of work in the Inland Northwest. And then we have um, Joanne Benita, who is a member and leader in the Latak County Human Rights Task Force I'm located in, um, she's located in Idaho in Moscow. Um, so thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm honored to just be amongst you today. Um, and the, I guess I wanted to start by inviting each of you to think back across your lives and your biographies and the various phases of life, institutions you've been through, experiences you've had. And if you could think about um, the way that your life has brought you to your current thinking on anti-Black racism and or anti-Semitism, um, I'd love to just get a, invite you all to share a couple of thoughts of um, how you arrived here at your current um, thinking. So um, maybe I'll kind of go in the order that I'm seeing you on my screen um, and invite um, Professor Joan Braun to, to start. Thank you. And I just really want to thank everyone for organizing this. Um, Mike and Neil and Jewish Family Services, um, Temple Beth Shalom, Congregation Emmanuel. Really, I think a really important conversation to be having. So I'm just really grateful um, to be here and that it's happening. Um, so I, I teach at Gonzaga University. I'm in uh, philosophy and um, part-time in leadership studies. And I'm affili affiliated there, as Mike said, with something called the Institute for Hate Studies. Um, which uh, researches, you know, what we can do to, to understand and prevent uh, white supremacist and hate movements. Um, going back to the, it goes back to the period of the Aryan nations in the Northwest. I've been here about five years. I come from an interfaith family. My mother's Jewish, my dad's Catholic. And I grew up um, very much in the social justice realm of those faith traditions. So um, I grew up going to rallies against war and mass incarceration and for immigrant rights. And so I'm coming out of that kind of life experience. Um, but for the past five years, my research has, uh, and my activism have been pretty heavily focused around fighting hate groups and fascism. And, um, and so I'm, I'm also kind of revisiting how I'm impacted by that as a person of Jewish descent. Um, so it, it's you. always different when you're working on an issue that um, affects you personally and affects your family. Um, but also there's so much opportunity for, for solidarity and work with other communities. Thank you, Professor. Um, maybe we'll go to Emily Kaufman next. To our mom. Sure, uh, so my name is Emily Kaufman. Um, as um, Mike mentioned, I am uh, uh, an investigative researcher with the ADL's uh, Anti-Defamation League. Um, and uh, through in my experience uh, at, at work, um, and one thing that really drew me to work at ADL was ADL's du dual mission uh, for uh, stopping the defamation of Jewish people, but also stopping all forms of hate, uh, because I think these uh, these things are, are really interconnected. Uh, in my personal history, I'm from uh, you know, a, a small town in, in the smallest state of Little Rhode Island, and I also grew up in an interfaith family, um, and uh, you know I've also had the um, you know unfortunate experience of comforting a parent who's dealt with uh, a hate incident, and so uh, certain uh, aspects of anti-Semitism have been, you know, re really central to my life. Um, but also in my early life, I um, had the uh, great opportunity to uh, travel to uh, South Africa, where learning about uh, discrimination uh, that was uh, so uh, draconian and so a part of society there uh, really allowed me to reflect on um, the uh, de facto segregation that exists within American society and uh, what uh, really woke me up to the kind of white privilege that I had to, uh, you know, not not being realizing, not realizing that within my own experience, but having to kind of go somewhere else and then, uh, you know, reflect back on that. So uh, in my undergraduate studies, I studied human rights uh, and cognitive science, um, and I've kind of focused uh, my career since then on looking at uh, language and hate. Uh, and how uh, in our modern system, this kind of kind of uh, increasing white supremacist rhetoric uh, really uh, impacts issues of anti-Semitism and hate against all groups. So really a privilege to be here. So thank you um, all very much for having me and really looking forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, Dr. Scott Finney, maybe you're next. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, and thank you for taking care of the nuts and bolts to make this happen and uh, with all those behind the scenes that were mentioned earlier. Um, I grew up in, uh, in the Bay Area in Oakland, California in the 60s and 70s. And so the uh, social revolution that seemed to 
epitomized that whole experience of being raised in that area at that time was one of social justice. And uh, I think uh, growing up in a family that was very much oriented that way, uh, the social justice has always been something in deep in my blood. Um, one of my cousins is Huey Newton, who had uh, been one of the founding uh, originators of the Black Panthers. So we've always had this debate going on within the household of what is social justice and what is the methodology best to reach it? Is, is it Malcolm? Is it Martin or, or what? And so uh, this has been something that has brought me up here uh, after playing basketball at Gonzaga to stick around and, and uh, give myself to higher education. So I've been teaching at uh, in the Africana Studies program um, since 1992 there at Eastern. And presently, uh, I'm not in administration anymore. I'm back to full time with the classroom setting. And uh, I'm also involved as a board member with the Peace Institute of Spokane Community College. Uh, and so I'm finding myself uh, doing as much in, in classroom settings as much as out, outside of classroom settings to uh, forward this, uh, I call a new horizon of uh, uh, civil rights. Uh, social media has added a new twist to everything. And so I, I'm glad to be here today, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you, Professor. Um, Joanne Manita. Um, I also thank the organizers of this very important uh, panel discussion, and I love the opportunity to meet the other panelists. Well, I was, I've lived uh, in Moscow, Idaho for 63 years, but I was born in New York City and in 1935. So I grew up during the Holocaust and didn't find out really till the end of the war that our whole family in Lithuania had been wiped out, except for one cousin who escaped to Shanghai. Um, and I also then was um, a young person during the civil rights struggles of the 40s, 50s, and 60s and um, learned with horror about the treatment of the Blacks who were trying to get their civil rights recognized. When I moved here to Idaho, I was still thinking that the bad guys and the problems were the Germans in, in Europe and the white people in the South. When I came here, there was a spate of, of swastikas being painted around in Pullman, Washington, adjacent to Moscow. And pretty soon, the Aryan nations were formed and neo-Nazis were marching down the streets of Coeur d'Alene. Um, it, it opened my activism to realize um, writing letters and, and taking part in marches wasn't enough. We needed more. And um, I was one of the people who formed the Lata County Human Rights Task Force. And uh, I've been um, active and uh, with a wonderful group of people in Moscow. And I'm also a member of the Moscow Human Rights Commission and the Moscow Interfaith Association. So we have a lot of people struggling for social justice in these difficult times. Thank you so much, Joanne. Thank you for being here. And, and last, but very much not least, Kiantha Duncan, hello. Hello, Mike. Good morning, everybody. And good morning to my fellow panelists as well. Dr. Finney, good to see you. Uh, I am the president of the NAACP and my experiences growing up in Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, which is the number one most segregated state in the United States of America. When, the, when I was younger, it was number two and it's now graduated to number one, has certainly influenced my desire to work in community, to work um, around social justice and belonging for everyone. And so the NAACP here in Spokane has been here for 103 years. Most people don't know that. 103 years, our, um, our corporate organization or a uh, big larger organization has been around for 117 years. And so we have been a part of doing this work and very happy to be here today to support what is happening in this cross-cultural collaboration and also to support our friends over at Temple Beth Shalom as well. Thank you so much all. Um, I'll say quickly about myself after growing up in Southern California, um, 
went to graduate school to study sociology and among other things, urban sociology and um, especially the um, development and use of public space in cities. And it's hard to study the history of um, land development in cities without running into issues of redlining and freeway development and kind of systematic ways in which racial segregation has unfolded. And um, LA, that's true. And Milwaukee, that's true. And Spokane, that's true. So um, it's been uh, a, an education to come to Spokane for the last um, four years or so and see so many of the same issues present here as in, in other cities across the country. Um, so that's just a little bit about me and my intellectual journey. But um, I wanted to uh, start the conversation by thinking about the ideological connections between um, anti-Black racism and anti-Semitism. It's easy to think of these things as totally disconnected from each other, but um, experts are consistently showing us ways in which they're, they're tied to one another. So um, maybe I'll start with um, Emily Kaufman, since this is kind of the work you, you do every day. Um, to tell us a little bit about what you see as the link between um, anti-Semitism and racism. Sure, absolutely. Um, so to kind of start here, right, uh, white supremacy is the term used to characterize various belief systems central to which are kind of one or, one or more of the following key tenets, right? Um, white supremacists believe that uh, white people should have dominance over people of other backgrounds, especially where they may coexist. Uh, that white people should live by themselves in a white only society, uh, that white people have their own culture and that this culture is superior to other cultures and that white people are genetically superior to other people. As a full fledged ideology, white supremacy is far more encompassing than simple racism or bigotry, right? Um, most white supremacists today further believe that the white race is in danger of extinction due to a rising flood of non-white people who are controlled and manipulated by Jews and that imminent action is needed to save the white race, right? So this is where we kind of start to see this come in. Um, and just by a kind of way of, because um, I know it's a bit confusing between you know, white supremacy and white nationalism, uh, white nationalism is a term that originated among white supremacists as a euphemism for white supremacy, right? Uh, so eventually some white supremacists tried to distinguish it further by using it to refer to a form of white supremacy that emphasizes defining a country or region Region by white racial identity and which seeks to promote the interests of white people exclusively, typically, of course, at the expense of people from other backgrounds. Um, but white nationalists and white supremacists use anti-Semitism to create a common enemy. Uh, white supremacists put forth the conspiracy that Jews control the government and the media, uh, and they have also claimed that anti-racist movements like Black Lives Matter, for example, have been quote unquote, infiltrated by Jews and therefore can't be trusted. And of course they do this with other movements as well, right? Um, they try to say that Jews are infiltrated and involved in these movements and therefore cannot be trusted. And then I also just wanted to touch on the fact that white genocide is a term that white supremacists use in their propaganda. It refers to a conspiracy theory that Jewish people are working to erase the, the so-called white race uh, by promoting things like immigration, intermarriage, and multiculturalism. And the great replacement is another term for white genocide, uh, for this white genocide conspiracy theory. So it might be um, you know, masked as that, but, but this, is, this is really you know, what, what that conspiracy talks about. So oftentimes people are not aware necessarily of how white nationalism and anti-Semitism have historically been intertwined, uh, but anti-Semitism and racism have intersected throughout US history. For example, in, in our recent history, uh, the Charlottesville Unite the Right rally um, was grounded in a long history of anti-Semitism in the United States, right, where we saw white supremacists coming together to gather and also chanting things like Jews will not replace us, right? Um, and lastly, I just kind of wanted to note that all systems of oppression are mutually reinforcing and a function of oppression is to divide oppressed groups and to create division within communities. And we have kind of a responsibility too with anti-Semitism because sometimes anti-Semitism can be the canary in the coal mine, so to speak. Uh, so when we see anti-Semitism in our own lives and in our own communities, it's really indicative that it's, excuse me, it's really important that we have um, allies in other communities so we can say, hey, this is happening in our community. We're seeing a rise in anti-Semitic incidents. This likely means that we are seeing um, other white supremacist incidents that are going to occur because these things are interconnected. In this world. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, that's wonderful and um, informative. Um, Professor Joan Braun, I know that you're um, kind of at the forefront of studying some of these issues. Um, 
do you have anything to add to the, to this conversation about the connection between racism and anti-Semitism? Yeah, uh, historically, um, you know, like Emily was saying, it, it is it's it's very intertwined. Um, I don't know how many people in just the general public in the United States, considering how uh, limited education is around the history of racism in this country and our public education system, um, how many people realized, for example, that um, Nazi ideology built upon um, white supremacist writers from the United States, like Madison Grant, um, Nazi eugenics laws were modeled on eugenics laws um, in the United States. There's a really great book about that called um, Hitler's American Model. So it, it goes back way into the eight, 1800s. Um, and when we look at the modern white supremacist movement, and by the way, so I think we wanna, so the word white supremacy is used different ways, right? And so we live in a white supremacist society um, where there's inequality, um, where white voices and white stories are privileged. Um, and so white supremacy is a system, um, a national and a global system in which we're enmeshed and which we're all impacted by. And when um, you know researchers on hate groups talk about white supremacy, so we're sort of talking on two, about two different things, right? So we're talking both about how this larger system impacts movements, but also about this reactionary far right um, hate movement um, that believes in fact that white supremacy, this system in which we're all enmeshed is like under threat and being demolished, even though it's, it's not, um, or not to the degree they think it is. They believe in fact that it's been defeated and that they're trying to bring it back. Um, so when we think about those movements, historically the connection with anti-Semitism goes back um, through the 19th century, but also in the modern contemporary situation with, with hate groups, when we think about the modern white nationalist, white supremacist, white power movement, a coalition really emerged after the, some of the successes of the civil rights movement in the South between Southern white racists and the KKK and those types of movements and Northern neo-Nazis and fascists who were more emphasizing anti-Semitism. And the way this coalition occurred was that Southern white racists could not explain to themselves in, in terms of their ideology how people that they viewed as so inferior were capable of leading these powerful movements for social change and winning these powerful victories um, and how that was possible. And anti-Semitism emerged as an answer for them, um, was presented as an answer for, for, to them. And so they believe you know, that um, in fact, the civil rights movement is like sort of puppets controlled behind the scenes by uh, a Jewish communist conspiracy. And so that belief system enabled a coalition that essentially is the nature of the current white supremacist or alt-right movement in the US today, um, which is both anti-Black and um, anti-Semitic. And we'll see, I'll, I'll come back to this when we talk about maybe critical race theory, but the conspiracy theories are very transferable. So you'll notice, for example, in Europe, um, sometimes they talk about the great replacement. Muslims will play the role instead of Jews in sort of bringing in non-white immigration. But this conspiracy theory that Jews are trying to destroy the whiteness of the world um, is leading to very concrete real violence, you know, like the mass shooting in Pittsburgh, um, where the shooter believed that Jewish charities were intentionally bringing in non-white immigrants and causing um, white genocide. Um, so it's, it's uh, very timely and urgent. Thank you. I suspect that maybe I'm not alone um, among our Jewish guests and um, panelists feeling the sense that, um, you know, we're enmeshed in this system of white supremacy as, as Jewish Americans and simultaneously are almost, uh, or often some of us are passing as, as white and, and in that way benefiting from a system of white supremacy. Um, and at the same time finding out like, oh wait, there are these ideological roots to that system that are deeply white supremacist. And I'll just say from my, um, uh, or are, are deeply anti-Semitic. And just from my, where I'm sitting, that's just dizzying and confusing. Um, Joanne or Professor Finney or Kiantha, do any of you want to um, jump in on this conversation about the connections here? Mm. You know, I'll just throw in something because uh, I love what our colleagues just said, the beautiful, uh, the way it was worded and hitting the core of it. You know, I, I just want to throw in two other items that relate to it, kind of other spokes into the, to the hub here. And that's this matter of both are heavily linked by this kind of scapegoat logic 
that uh, white supremacy has used uh, as looking at the African American and our Jewish brothers and sisters as the reason why things are going downward, you know, in a very vague but very strong um, uh, way. And then number two, um, the uh, demonizing of Zionism and of BLM, um, requiring um, those of us on both uh, groups needing to snatch back the narrative, uh, very similar to what uh, Colin Kaepernick experienced. Um, his, his was purely, I'm kneeling because of what's happening out on the streets, uh, the injustice, yet that was demonized to be you're against the military. So that same kind of tactic, whether scapegoat or snatching the narrative is, is strong, very much, I believe, two strong links between, between both groups. But I'll, I'll pass the ball. Thank you. Keon third, Joanne, an, an opportunity to jump in, or I'll, I'm also happy to, to keep it moving because I'd love to have time at the end to, to open up for some questions from the audience. Um, and we'll have plenty. Joanne? Probably we will discuss this at the end, but it's frustrating uh, for me to see that people get worried about white nationalism, but not they don't recognize the anti-Semitic roots of it. And uh, I think that in my mind, it's so linked that I, um, I know other Jewish people feel like, why don't they see this as the link? Yeah, and when both Joan and Emily were talking, it was striking to me to hear about how each feeds the other in this kind of mutually reinforcing cycle. Um, I, I hadn't conceptualized that quite as clearly. So thank, thank you all. So um, I have this sense that understanding these ideological connections is just extremely important to foster a shared sense of solidarity in this moment in history, especially. But I also have this sense that we can't oversell the similarity of the contemporary fates of especially white Jews and um, our African American neighbors. Um, so I think we also have to talk about some of the important differences between racism, anti-Black racism especially, and anti-Semitism. Um, and those differences are often rooted in our two groups' very different histories in this country. Um, so, um, a question is, um, you know, how does the history of anti-Black racism in America create a distinct contemporary reality for Black Americans today, um, and, and distinct especially from, um, say, white Jews? And maybe I'll start with Dr. Finney, if um, you wouldn't mind um, trying that question. Sure, you bet. That that one is worth uh, several afternoons of discussion. But right. You bet. We'll, we'll capsulize some things, and then I'll pass the ball quickly. Um, you know, the, the similarities are quite striking. Uh, the uh, devotion to the homeland, the realization that by looking back at history is how we self-define ourselves and not are defined by the outside, um, the need to inoculate our kids uh, and, and give them the narrative of what they're going to, ex what to expect outside in the outside world. So many commonalities. But then, you know, one of the most striking differences, of course, is the genetic characteristics that betray our African descent. Uh, it, at no time uh, is uh, even someone who was half uh, black or what we call multiracial. Um, you know, there was always a debate, what's, uh, what's Tiger Woods? Is he this or is he that? I said, well, if he commits a crime, he's black. So there's a commonality that <laughs> falls into the skin tone that after 225 years of slavery and 345 years of racial segregation in this country, it's impossible to uh, turn this ship without first, as uh, Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman said, we have to first learn how to take account of race before we can get beyond race. And so uh, the issue of, of race is such a, a big thing, not in the way that it's a social construct and it's a myth biologically, but that the genetic characteristics have been aligned to uh, the myth of inferiority or and thereof, like you said before, of uh, supremacy. So that, that's a very, very big one. The, the, another thing is the idea of Jim Crow uh, that gave uh, birth to this idea of separation was that there was a genetic inherent inferiority within the people of African descent. 
And that is greatly, uh, I would say, in contrast to what's attributed stereotypically to Jews as being the masterminds of manipulation and, you know, uh, supernatural gifts to uh, take over. So it's interesting how uh, the polarity there of uh, what's, you know, attributed to our white Black, uh, our black brothers and sisters and, and the Jewish brothers and sisters in the way of inferiority and superiority. And then I, I think uh, the other thing is the issue of faith. Uh, most African-Americans hold to the Christian faith, the Protestant faith that is very strong uh, within this country as a WASP nation, uh, whereas the uh, Jewish faith is considered you know, on the outside and we have yet to have a Jewish president and what would that be on the Sabbath for such a thing? You know, there's there's differences in areas of faith, I think in inferiority, superiority kind of myth, and especially in the area of, of skin color that we've yet to get through uh, in this country. I mean, uh, you think about the Loving decision versus Virginia um, in 1967, that 15 other states besides Virginia did not acknowledge interracial marriage based purely on African-American descent genetics. And uh, that's a shocking thing that it, uh, it took uh, that long for the Supreme Court to finally say, wait a minute, we can't be that skin color oriented as to ignore marriage. So uh, that, that's a big, those are three big factors that I see, but I'll pass the ball. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Kianta, maybe I'll pass it to you. Where, what are you thinking about? Absolutely. So thank you, Dr. Finney. And I am purposely going after you because you are the man with the information that I love to hear. So I will say this, while I don't want to, as you said, oversell similarities, and I know that in this question, we're focusing on what those uh, differences are, I do need to say this. For me, in the way that my mind thinks, we sort of always are um, are connected in more ways than we are different. And so when I think about anti-Semitism and racism, they are both completely, completely grounded in this concept of keeping some of us uh, at the bottom of the barrel, keeping some of us unsafe, keeping some of us unhealthy, and keeping others, others being typically um, the white, white race, uh, in a position of power. And so it is sometimes difficult for me, I will say, to see the differences always because the similarities have a higher weight in my mind. I just see all of the ways in which we are so much alike and experiencing similar things, different versions of the same thing, but the same thing. Thank you so much for that. Um, at the risk of surprising either of you with a with a potential with with a follow up question, um, it struck me that this might be a moment to ask you about a term that we hear a lot in contemporary political discourse, which is um, people talking about structural or systemic racism. And when I think about those terms, maybe that's maybe getting to the heart of some of the important differences between anti-Black racism and anti-Semitism in the country. So I wonder if either of you have a thought on like, when you hear people talk systemic or structural racism, where does your mind go when you hear that phrase? So I, <laughs> I am a very, uh, unorthodox thinker, as you all learned today and maybe already know this, but when I hear the words systemic racism and systemic systems, I, I actually am kind of tickled by that. And the reason why it tickles me is that uh, these, these systems were created. They were created. So it's not like this is what was in the beginning. Mm -hmm. This was created. And so, um, when I hear people say things like, we need to get at the root of systemic racism or systemic anti-Semitism, it makes me feel as if um, we, we are kind of missing the boat because what we need to get at is the root of power. And if we get at the root of power, we will get to, it will trickle down to how that impacts us in terms of racism and anti-Semitism. But we need to get to the root of power and the value that it has had in our country over um, you know, 300, 400 years. Let, let's talk about that more than systemic. Let's talk about what it is actually holding, the adhesive that is holding the systemic issue together, which is power. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Dr. Finney, anything to add? 
Sure. Yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, that was beautiful. You know, the, the, just like critical race theory has been put into a, a box, just like uh, BLM. Uh, I, I gave a, a presentation at Spokane Community College this week, and I mentioned when you see BLM, do you think of it as only Black Lives Matter, or do you see it as Black Lives Matter too? It all depends. Do you have something as a preface, or how do you end that phrase? And in the same way, critical race theory, as we know, uh, it hits this matter, like, like Kanta was just saying, regarding structural uh, racism and structural discrimination. And when we think of CRT, it's a, it's a useful way for those who don't want to give up power, who don't want to admit the issue of power is really at stake, to cloak it in at this kind of, you're blaming everyone that's white uh, for something. Uh, actually, um, I, I appreciate uh, by bringing out the truth as the power issue, we can back up and look at this thing, critical race theory, which the pre President Trump back in September of 2020 um, made a, a federal a executive order that no federal contract shall be, uh, you know, aligned with anyone teaching CRT. And as a result, across the country, immediately 300 diversity training sessions, diversity and inclusion sessions, were excluded and brought to a halt. And it's unfortunate because what we really see here is not only the cloaking of "I want to keep the power," but we also see the fact that to step back, as critical race theory did in its beginnings in the early 1970s uh, and uh, late 70s among scholars, legal scholars, they tried to realize what is it that was gained in the 60s that was so quickly lost by the 70s. And they saw the structure was the issue. What's embedded in policies was the issue. And like was mentioned, the outcome are these episodes that we see, but you step back, the structure has been created to produce those outcomes. Uh, the, the murder, the tragic uh, killing of George Floyd uh, was an episode, a snapshot, but a structure produced that sort of thing to even happen. Even the presidency of Barack Obama, now that we're in the <clears throat> post-racial America kind of talk, it points to the, uh, the fact that the structure has not changed. Yes, as an episodic, I think, miracle, I never dreamed of it, an African-American man made it to the White House. Uh, I never dreamed that could happen. And now we have an African-American uh, uh, female as vice president. These are episodes untouched when it comes to structural change, because what is at the tip end of the structural change is power change. And so I, I think um, uh, one of the things we need to realize when we talk about structural racism, think of it as this, this way. Left-handed people have quite a story that they could tell because everything in this country is geared towards right-handers. Now, we're not saying right-handers are bad people, and I'm a right-hander, I don't wake up in the morning, more power to the right-handed people, but I guarantee you, when I pull out a notebook, I don't have to worry about writing across the page. When I drive a stick shift, I don't have to go like that to, uh, I mean, it goes on and on. You know, The right-handed world uh, is something that's invisible to us. But we could, we could, and I believe we need to hear from the left-handers. That's what critical race theory is saying. The power of the narrative of lived experiences in the onslaught of structural, uh, I would say, uh, discrimination, put it lightly, has to be heard in order to get at the truth of the issue of critical race theory, which is getting at the truth of racism with us getting at the truth of power. So if we see that parallel, then we can understand critical race theory is the pathway to get to the heart of the issue. And so I, I'm uh, excited not to see, can we come up with winners and losers? Can we point fingers and blame? But can we re-narrate what critical race theory is really saying? And can we come together as a collective group of people who realize we've inherited a mess that unless we look at it directly, we can never straighten it out for the sake of the generations behind us. Thank you very much for that. Um, like if I could say really quickly to Dr. Finney, that was perfect. The left-handed, right-handed, because I am a lefty. So that is the best analogy that I've heard. But one of the other things that sticks out for me around critical race theory is that where we went wrong was using the word race in it. We should have just said critical history 
theory, uh, because then we would have gotten maybe a little less pushback, because this is really our, the history of our nation. It is not just the history of the race relations in our nation. It is the history of our nation. And so if we phrase and word it differently, maybe we could have split it in under a couple more doors a little more easily. But because we added in that construct of race, the one in which we know is not real, because we added that into it, that has created an automatic defense to us learning about the critical history of America. Thank you both. Um, yeah, really beautiful. I love that left hand analogy. Also, I might steal that from you and use it in class. But I was just going to add that um, when I talk about structural racism in my sociology classes, I usually tell my students that structure is like a metaphor that we use to talk about the accumulation of historical advantages and disadvantages. And then my mind goes to like the history of housing in this country and the fact that um, Although I come from, you know, a long um, Jewish lineage on one side and, and white American lineage on, on the other, my family, um, you know, I'm probably a fourth generation homeowner. And if you go back, you know, to four generations back, the laws were very explicit about who could own homes and who could not. And we know that wealth building opportunities are really tied to land ownership in this country. And so the, the laws do not have to be explicitly racist anymore to be that kind of tail historical end of a long history of um, wealth disparity across racial groups. So th just that little example um, helps me kind of clarify um, what we mean by, by structural racism. And I want to turn um, to any of our other um, Jewish identifying panelists, having heard us kind of spin our wheels about structural racism. Um, does that help you think about how different the experiences are for Jewish, especially white Jewish Americans today from African Americans? Joanne? I would say definitely. Uh, I, I'm new to the uh, phrase structural racism and more systemic racism and uh, Yes, Black people are the victims of systemic racism. And as white Jews, we're part of the system. And uh, we don't in ever intend to uh, oppress anyone, but it's the way the system is, has been set up. And uh, I think that's a huge difference that um, in spite of all of our sim similarities in, in this country, we have to face that in order to go to the next step of working together, you need to face the difference. Thank you, Joan. Emily or Joan, yeah, I, any, any thoughts? I would just add in, I mean, I think this came out a little bit when I was talking about my own personal history, right? I had massive white privilege to not be able to, um, to even to see the kind of de facto segregation of my own community because I was, I, you know, was in a predominantly white community and it wasn't actually until I, was learning about and understanding systems of oppression and in other places that I was able to kind of really see, you know, how how entrenched this was, um, you know, within, within my own community. So I think that's um, really important, right? I've benefited from all of these privileges that, you know, prevented me from, from even even seeing <laughs> seeing that as, you know, as, as a person growing up in the, you know, in the 90s and the, the early 2000s. And the history that I was taught in school in, in the 90s was that, you know, the civil rights struggle was something that happened, but we moved past it, right? And that we, we were now stronger. And that was, I think, this, this myth that was told us. And it, it was this whole process of unlearning and relearning, you know, throughout the rest of my educational history um, to, to kind of un undo that. And like Dr. Finney was saying, you know, to teach the the actual, the, the history of, of the United States, right? The, the actual history. And so I think it's, um, uh, no, I think, um, you know, as, as a, a white Jewish person, it's, it, it's really important to, to recognize um, the, those privileges that we have um, that I'd, uh, shape our understanding of our own identity within the United States. Thank you, Emily. Joan? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah thank you. Um, that, um... I think the systemic context and the issue of power um, that Keontha raised is really important. Um, yeah, I think just to kind of echo some things that other people were saying and, and add to that, the um, I think it's really important, um, those of us that are white Jews, and it's important also to you know remember that not all Jews are white. In fact, there are a lot of non-white Jews, there are black Jews and Jews of other ethnicities. 
um, and racial backgrounds. But um, sometimes I, I hear people sort of hesitating who are Jewish to say that they're white if they're white. And I think that's unhelpful because we do, we do have white privilege um, and race is, as you know, but just to kind of, you know, give us some, some language here, it's a social construct and people get incorporated into whiteness. Like there was a debate at one point in American history about whether Italians were white or whether Irish people were white. And those debates have been settled. And it is true that Nazis don't consider um, white Jews to be white, but everybody else, in, including the systems of policing, of education, everybody else in American society considers Jews white, uh, who are white Jews. And I think that's important because like we do have to acknowledge our privilege. I'm even hesitant about language like passing. I don't think we're white passing. I think we're just white. Um, and you know, when you look back at like Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, for example, it was addressed to white Protestant, white Catholic clergy and white rabbis who were all you know, saying in the South, you know, you're going too fast. I don't know about the civil disobedience thing. So the history is complex. We're enmeshed you know, in the history of racism in this country, not just in the history of, of working together for liberation. Um, I don't know if I, you know, just to kind of share quickly one other kind of experience I had. Um, so just to kind of demonstrate to people how embarrassing and ridiculous um, white people are capable of being on the, these things. You know, I had a conversation several years ago with a black colleague who had an illness that was historically linked to Ashkenazi, um, like white Jewish DNA. And so I did the thing that Jewish people tend to do when we hear that somebody might have Jewish DNA. And it's driven, of course, with positive intent. It's like wanting to welcome people into Jewishness because so many people had to bury their Jewish history um, because of histories of anti-Semitism. So I was like, oh, that's, that's really interesting. Like maybe you're Jewish, like was it on your mother's side? Like, and then she had to basically stop me and say, you know, that's not a positive history for me because if I have Jewish DNA, um, Ashkenazi Jewish DNA, that's probably related to the history of enslavement and sexual violence in this country. And that was a real wake up call for me. Like I need to be thinking about, you know, the ways in which, um, you know, Jewish people have been enmeshed in these histories of oppression. Thank you for that. Um, Maybe in the interest of time, we'll, we'll keep going to our next topic, which is about um, the politics, about teaching, about race and racism in schools, which we know is one of the most kind of potent political issues uh, today is about how we teach children about these issues, about oppression of all kinds. Um, and and um, as Dr. Finney was mentioning, um, this really took off recently around debates about critical race theory. and. Professor Finney, I know you were just kind of talking about critical race theory. Um, I wonder if I could turn it back to you to kind of give us a, um, a basic definition of it. And then maybe also to comment on whether it's being taught in schools. Is that a, yeah. is that a real thing that's sure. happening? Sure, you bet, you bet. You know, I, I've done some diversity training in the area and uh, Cheney School District, for instance, uh, asked me to devote a whole session towards this very issue. And the first thing I mentioned to them was, well, None of us, especially K through 12 educators, directly teach critical race theory uh, as a hub. We'll use the spokes. Anytime you use autobiographical information, that's a major spoke of critical race theory because lived experiences and the narrative thereof is central to really, I would say, increasing a true body of, of research about race in this country. Uh, that's one aspect. Um, another aspect, like we've just mentioned, is this matter of structural racism that within uh, the core policies um, and, and structures of our um, history, as was mentioned earlier, deeply embedded is the issue of race. But it's not to point a finger at people today. It's talking about what we've inherited and whether we're pushing that along or are we going to scrutinize it question it and even bring it down, or as Mal Malcolm X would say, bring it all the way down so we could really have integration. Uh, he didn't want to beg his way into that existing house of integration as, as he saw it. 
And uh, really, he was a critical race theorist at that point, saying those kind of things. So at the core is this matter of the narrative of lived experiences. And also at the core of, of critical race theory is this fact that racism and the colorism has been deeply embedded and has been created from its foundation. Uh, I would say, as was mentioned earlier by my sister, purely at the start of how things went in, er in order to distribute who's going to get the power and who's going to have access to power. And so those two items, structural racism and the narrative of lived experiences, are really the centerpiece of critical race theory. But it's, it's a way of analyzing. It's a way of, of critically looking at something. It's not uh, reaching an already made verdict that all white people are a certain way or, or our colleagues around us are, are this way because of their skin color not being of African descent. So it's almost like a debunking of the myth and the demonizing of, of what it is and coming to seeing it's a lens for scrutiny. It's a lens for understanding. The patchwork of the 50s and 60s civil rights movement didn't change the structure. And as, as a result, when we look at healthcare today, we look at in, incarceration rates, sentencing, uh, on and on mortgage loans, I mean, it's, it's nonstop uh, health care. My goodness, something still is there. And it's not a, a, an indictment on all white people. It's a call to use this analytical tool. And if we can get around a common table of fellowship and look at this as a team of human beings, because we all are brothers and sisters, can we come together and look at it from a lens that is based on experiential reality. And what can we do to reverse it and, and not point fingers or blame, not get see who are the winners and losers, but how can we really bring about e pluribus unum? That's what we're really all talking about out of many one, but where is that being realized? I think, I think critical race theory is marvelous, but it's a, I like a call of a post-secondary uh, experience that is being taught in certain schools, but a lot not so but the spokes of it are heavily used because as an analytical tool, it's invaluable. Unfortunately, it's been so demonized that it's us against them. So I, I think uh, the key is to see what is, it, what is it really and why is it so convenient to use it as a cloak to cover up the issue of power and the embedded reality that racial differentiation, skin color, not, not the social construct that really is there is always going to be at the middle of it until we are willing to admit it. Uh, I would say tap into it, expose it, and then come to a common terms and conditions that we all can live with. It's, it's, we're on the verge, I think, but uh, we, we have to first be willing to be civilized about what is critical race theory. Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, Keontae, go ahead. Yeah, so I just wanted to add in before we moved on, something that is, um, really present in my mind and in my heart around this work, which is we, we really need to be careful about how we demonize, demonize white Jewish people who have been able to surfacely exist within the systems that value white power and whiteness. So there is this piece that separates us because we, we almost want to put value on our suffering. So my suffering has been more because I did not, you know, and was not able to gain any benefit from a system that, again, supports whiteness. And we have to get beyond that. We have to get beyond that because that though it's it's those little bitty uh, intricacies that keep us from getting to the truth and the real transformative work. We get caught up on that kind of stuff. So in no way do I want anyone who is uh, a white Jew to feel any sort of burden by having been able to benefit from these systems of whiteness. That there's no there's no use in that. There's no use in that. And so I just want us to be, be mindful of that as well. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, and that actually maybe kind of nudges the conversation about CRT in the direction I was going anyways. And I was going to say, you know, we know that in third grade classrooms, nobody's reading Derek Bell and Kimberly Crenshaw and these people. Um, so then the, the question for me is like, what is this anti-CRT movement doing? Like, what are they doing by, by bringing this up so much? Um, 
And so there, my question is like, how does the anti-CRT movement um, limit perhaps our capacity to teach children about racism, anti-Semitism, anti-LGBTQ rights um, and other forms of oppression? Um, Joanne, I saw your hand start to float up. I don't know if I took the conversation in a different direction. Sure. From the, from the lens of Idaho, yeah. uh, anti-CRT is being used to defund and undermine public schools. That's the radical right agenda. And oh good, CRT, we can use that one. And it's working because it plays on the fears of white people that they are being demonized, even if they're not. Even if we are teaching social justice, even if we say the Pledge of Allegiance with liberty and justice for all every day, they, they are using it and it's working in our state very well. And uh, I think it, that was the plan. They, they found something good to use and making full uh, power with it. Thank you, Joanne. Um, Professor Braun, I wanna bring you in too. Yeah, the attack on, on critical race theory, uh, which is so frightening, in shutting down academic freedom and shutting down any education around race um, or any other oppression in, in schools. Um, it's another space where we see the history of this intersection between anti-Semitism and anti-Black um, racism that, that forged the sort of modern white power movement. Sometimes you'll hear this term cultural Marxism. And I've done some research on this because my doctoral work was on the Frankfurt School, which was a group of um, German Jewish intellectuals that were that formed a new branch of social theory and social philosophy. And there's a whole conspiracy theory about these um, German Jewish intellectuals um, called cultural Marxism, according to which the Frankfurt School has taken over everything in modern culture. The, the entertainment systems, the news, all social movements, right? So again, we see the sort of Jewish control of the civil rights movement narrative again. Um, the LGBTQ movement is controlled by cultural Marxism, all of this stuff. And this vastly overestimates, of course, this small group of like 10 professors <laughs> that wrote some books, right? And you'll hear the same narrative brought up again, um, like, um, Christopher Rufo and um, James Lindsay, who are the main pundits around um, critical race theory, sometimes they'll mention the Frankfurt School or they'll drop in this word cultural Marxism. So they're, they're melding again anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism into the same narrative. Thank you so much. It, anyone else want to chime in on the politics of um, teaching and schools? I, I would just add, oh I'm sorry did, did someone oh, else say something I'm sorry <laughs> um I just want to say um you know beyond um even the the mainstream or you know again we kind of are, are seeing these lines blur a little bit between what's mainstream and what's extreme um but extremists right are, are really trying to harness this debate around critical race theory to perpetuate the white supremacist conspiracy theory um that that Joan just mentioned, right, that the white race is under attack, right? They are using this to say, this is evidence uh, towards our theory. Um, and we have seen extremists um, attend school board meetings. We have seen um, them consider places where debates about critical race theory are taking place, uh, are taking place as fertile grounds for recruitment efforts. So for example, we've seen um, the Aryan nations targets uh, uh, Jewish community members and black community members with uh, racist propaganda because um, there was a debate uh, on critical race theory taking place like in that neighborhood. Um, I'm thinking of Litchfield Park in Arizona in this case, and we are, are right, we're, we're seeing people try to take advantage of this. So that was just um, an aside to say that, you know, extremists um, see this as uh, the, this debate as uh, a thing that they can use as, as another tool to, to advance their, their conspiracy theories around us. And if you look at the lists of books that are banned or trying to be banned in, in local school districts, um, some of them are about the Holocaust, like the Mouse um, series, but then also, of course, a lot of books that have to do with the African-American experience and the history of racism, and then a lot that have to do with the LGBTQ experience and anything that questions kind of rigid gender roles, gender binaries, anything about sexuality. So that's just a reminder that this um, anti-CRT ideas get into all kinds of attempts to promote justice and equity in the country. Um, final thoughts on this issue before we turn to the Inland Northwest? Okay, let's go there. Um, so 
our last topic is, is about the Inland Northwest today, and then um, I hope we'll have some time for questions from the audience. Um, what is I, my, what is the state of racism and anti-Semitism in Spokane and the broader inland Northwest today? And and maybe um, Joanne, if if it's okay, I could maybe start with you because I know um, you're uh, kind of on the front lines of some of this work in in Idaho. And so I wonder what you're seeing from your vantage point. Uh, I'm certainly not qualified to speak about Spokane. Uh, as a, a, from our vantage point in Moscow, Idaho, we're seeing the growth of anti-Semitism movements uh, through, throughout the inland north, throughout the Northwest, I would say, including Seattle very much. And uh, in it's the first time we saw it was Temple Beth Shalom, which was vandalized. And at the same time, so was the Anne Frank Memorial. And then, Again, the Anne Frank Memorial with, with distribution of anti-Semitic material throughout the neighborhood there. Um, I think that uh, this started really with the beginning of the Trump era where white supremacy felt uh, it could step up what it was doing. And then various people such as um, started movements such as what they call the Goyim, uh, well, the Idaho Freedom Foundation is one and the, the Goyim Defense League is another. Um, when, for example, in, in Moscow, I remember that um, at the close of February, when the, before the pandemic started, we were talking about having a Purim party for children and our Jewish community was, debating whether they needed to hire a um, security guard, for example. And then when I was over in Seattle, I uh, drove by the um, Sephardic synagogue and they had a gate there. And my, uh, that wasn't there before. And my brother-in-law said that they have a security guard for all their service. So um, we do feel the, the growth of that. And uh, from the point of view of our, um, our human rights task force. I take very much, whether it was Joan or Emily said, the canary in the mine. We, we know from our long history, we start with anti-Semitism and, and they use that to spread hatred. And whether it's racial, um, Asian, Hispanic, whatever. And so we feel that people need to work together um, from the start. We're way ahead of where we, and now we see the white supremacist planning rallies in Coeur d'Alene, which is what we started with uh, 30, 40 years ago. But we're ahead because now we have human rights organizations in all these communities. The churches are more aware and the businesses who, it took, it took the businesses in Coeur d'Alene to realize that it was hurting tourism before they kind of got on board, but they're on board now. So uh, I think that from the point of view of what's happening, I'm thinking about what should happen is that we continue to work together as a unit and worry less about our differences and more about our similarities. So that's my input for right now. Thank you so much. Um, Professor Finney or, or Kianta. Yeah, I would love to, to, to answer that one. How is racism, what is the state of racism and, and anti-Semitism in the Pacific Northwest? It is alive and well, alive and well, really. And while we are, um, as, as Ms. Joan mentioned, while we do have organizations, civil rights organizations, we do have um, you know, different committees and folks that are, are working on this daily, we still are barely scratching the surface because as we work to pick a little bit of the paint away, we find that there are layers and layers and layers underneath and underneath the nine layers of paint is a wallpaper. So there is just so much to do. So that is why I'd say it is alive and well, alive and well. There are, now I do wanna be, be mindful because you know, if I don't have hope around this, then I can't even 
talk, I can't talk to the work, I can't be close to it in any way. So I do see that there is certainly hope in the number of people who are um, organizing. So like you said, Ms. Joan, the business owners now see it from a different perspective because it's affecting their bottom line, it's affecting revenue. But so well, however they got there, they're part of the team now. And that is a good thing. I also feel like uh, it is good that the conversations are more openly had uh, about how we create a different system and a different way of living in the Pacific Northwest. But in the interim, back to my initial statement, it is still alive and well. So there's there's still just so much more work to do. Thank you. Professor Finney, did you have anything to, to add to the state of racism in Spokane? Or, okay. She, she put it well, my sister put it well. <laughs> alive and well, unfortunately. Um, Emily, I know you kind of monitor extremist online spaces in the inland Northwest. I wonder what you're seeing. Sure. Yeah. So I can um, just put out put out some numbers. Then again, this is just you know for like everything that everyone has said. I think is has really done done a uh, you know phenomenal job by uh, talking about how how serious um, you know the, the issue is. Um, but just for some numbers uh, from 2020 uh, to 2021, uh, we saw 26 incidents of white supremacist propaganda distributions in Spokane, um, and eight anti-Semitic incidents. Right. Um, and these you know I am. Um, you, you know these things, so me saying them to you is, you know, is uh, only to just to emphasize the kind of uh, things that we're seeing, right? In January 2021, uh, we saw 14 first uh, neo-Nazi group, a, a new neo-Nazi group, right, distribute propaganda that included swastikas and messages that read Hitler was right. The propaganda also encouraged white people to quote unquote, defend their race. Uh, then in February 2021, we saw 14 First again distribute propaganda throughout Spokane, including at the KHQ radio station and within the Emerson Garfield neighborhood. Also in February 2021, we saw Temple Beth Shalom right in South Hill vandalized with swastika graffiti uh, and the synagogue's Holocaust uh, memorial was also damaged. Uh, and then in May of 2021 in Spokane, we saw Patriot Front, uh, who is a white supremacist group that relies heavily on propaganda efforts, spray paint stencils of its logo on a Black Lives Matter, uh, on a Black Lives Matter mural. Uh, so these incidents right underscore the ways that white supremacist groups attempt to intimidate black and Jewish people in Eastern Washington and how integral it is that our communities stand together on these issues to combat hate. And I'll just highlight um, that uh, at the Anti-Defamation League, we have um, a heat, we call it the heat map, which stands for uh, hate, extremism, anti-Semitism, and terrorism. And so you can actually zoom in on this map to, uh, to your neighborhood so you can see the incidents that are being tracked. Um, and we regularly do put out reports to show you know, how this um, uh, relates to the kind of national landscape on anti-Semitism and hate. Thank you so much for mentioning that. And then what are challenges? Oh, Joanne, go ahead. Oh, you're you're muted. I was just going to say that's why panels like this are so vital because I think um, as Jews and Blacks, we need to discuss our similarities and our differences because these hate groups would love nothing more than to keep us separate because together we're stronger, you know? I, I think, I sometimes think all the different groups are like fingers, you know, blacks and the Jews and the gays, and, but if we come together, we're a fist, so. Thank you for that. Um, Joan, anything to add to uh, this conversation, Professor Braun? Yeah, so I think we're sort of on this last question now, looking at solidarity and challenges, right? Sure, um, yeah. So, you know, I think, I mean, I, I've sort of brought up this issue of, of white privilege. Um, so I think that's important, um, you know, to sort of think about. Um, but these intersections are are so real as well, you know, between anti-Black racism and anti-Semitism and between all types of oppression whether it's um, you know, transphobia, Islamophobia, homophobia, nativism, um, ableism, you kind of go down the list and oftentimes the same conspiracy theory format is being employed against different groups of people. So there's so much potential for, for solidarity. And I've noticed, you know, I kind of think about it as the image of the octopus. Conspiracy theorists love octopuses, especially like anti-Semitic conspiracy theorists. Um, you'll see these kinds of octopi images or spider images where the different legs or the different tentacles or all of these different oppressed groups. 
And I, you know, I kind of say, you know, when somebody puts you on their octopus map, you need to sort of claim your tentacle with pride and not be like, oh, I'm not like, you know, I'm not with Black Lives Matter or oh, I'm not with the, uh, you know, LGBTQ movement, but actually, you know, unite together as people that are being targeted. And, you know, I think there's a, there's a real tendency among, and I, it's intergenerational trauma in the Jewish community. There's this tendency to seek security you know, so quickly, right? And there's a reality to that, to needing security guards and that kind of thing. And, but, and also, you know, like I think about some Jewish family members who like, there's a, there's a sense that you might need to be ready to go. You might need your passport, like make sure your passport's updated in case you're not safe. And that's a reality, but I think at the same time, like safety comes more through solidarity than through securitization or fleeing or isolation. So, you know, working together with um, the black community, the Muslim community, the LGBT community, et cetera, that's really where we're gonna understand the threats we're all facing and be able to stand up for each other and really achieve safety and justice. So one other thing, Mike, that um, uh, Dr. Vaughn just made me think of. So this is one critical difference, I believe. So because uh, Jewish individuals have had access to resources. So when you just said that there is this, this thinking for some Jewish people that we need to be ready to go, that, that security and getting ready and being able to get ready to go is not present in Black communities because Black communities haven't had access to the resources that would allow us to be able to get ready on a dime if we need to. So that's one of the differences that I think is critical to realize and not see as a negative because you have it in Blacks don't, but just as a reality of what it is and a reality of the ways in which systemic racism, uh, systemic, uh, power and control have played a role and how they continue to show up. I believe it was a little bit earlier when uh, Mike said uh, that he was a fourth generation homeowner, a fourth generation homeowner. And that was another thing. So blacks aren't necessarily first or second generation homeowners because there have been blacks who own homes since you know history and memoria. However, there are more Blacks who have not been able to keep and maintain those homes or keep that wealth because they did not have access to resources that would allow you to continue to pass on that generational wealth to your families. So those are some of the differences that, again, it's not to vilify anybody or not to say one thing is worse than the other. It is just to say there are some similarities and then there are some realities or some caveats to our similarities and realities. Yeah, yeah. can I add a little something to that? That, that was beautiful. Uh, Just Tracy. before you do, Professor Finney, maybe sure. I can invite our audience to start thinking about questions and we're gonna take questions in the chat. So if you have thoughts, uh, some people are already sharing some resources and some events that have happened in their communities, which is wonderful. If you have specific questions for our panelists, you could go ahead and start typing those into the chat while we um, hear from Professor Finney. Thank you. Great. Along these themes, I, I uh, found an article yesterday at CNN.com, Jewish and Japanese American groups among growing multiracial effort calling for reparations for Black Americans. And it mentions uh, in one of the subheadings, a Jewish moral call. Some in the American Jewish community have long garnered support for reparations. In 2019, the Union for Reform Judaism passed a resolution in favor of reparations calling for a federal commission to study and develop proposals for reparation to redress the historic and continuing eff uh, effects of slavery and systemic racism against black Americans. And uh, one of the leaders mentioned this, that acknowledging and paying reparations is an important step in the healing process. And really, that's really, I think, really the core here. The German government really did what they needed to do with the truth and reconciliation and have made a commitment to as much as possible, making an effort to repair the harm that was done because the Jewish community has, has, has had its own historic trauma they can make the connection and understand how important the process of reparation is for Black Americans. So I, I really believe the differences point towards, uh, like what Joanne said, let's get up out of our silos and what can we do to join in? And as Kantha just mentioned, how can we even bring up access 
to be equal so we can be mobilized and move on. So I just wanted to mention that that was CNN.com uh, yesterday. Thank you for that. Um, that reminds me of a, a, an article that I like to assign by um, journalist uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates called The Case for Reparations, which is a long history of housing policy in America, but, but towards the end, he gets into um, German reparations after the Holocaust as a model for the way that something like that could work. And it's just another reminder about um, the ties between anti-Semitism and racism. Um, so we are starting to get questions and comments, which is wonderful. Um, let's see. Um, Shirley Grossman asks, how can we have an impact on the bigoted thinking when so many people are exposing themselves to only one point of view? Yes, I take that to be a, a question about kind of our, our media diet um, and, and how, where we go for information and, and um, in anybody with thoughts on that, I'd be happy to open it up to any of you. I mean, it's a really hard question. <laughs> um, I can talk from um, the kind of, ex, you know, uh, extremism side of things. And unfortunately, I see um, in, in the, the work that I'm engaged with, right, uh, folks um, operating exactly like you're talking about in these kind of disinformation silos, right, whether it's um, uh, anti-vaccine uh, disinformation or whether it's uh, it's white supremacist uh, kind of thinking like there there are these places that exist that are, are really unmoderated and where um, actually people are presented with information that can can seem like fact, uh, but is coming from uh, from places that are, are just promoting disinformation, right? So I think it's really critical that we teach, um, we teach our youth to be uh, critical consumers of information, right? To help them recognize disinformation and question uh, things that are being presented. Um, but there's also the responsibility um, for, for kind of tech companies uh, to, to do more to regulate that and to uh, prevent people from kind of getting caught in these radicalization spirals. Uh, but I think you're, you're highlighting like a really uh, crucial issue that uh, when you are being fed information from a few sources um, and when that information is, is either missed or disinformation, uh, it, it, it's really dangerous and can promote a lot of the, the kind of uh, systemic issues that we were, we were talking about today. Also, I'll just add in to me, the uh, inv invitation for dialogue is so crucial. Uh, we have to uh, keep pressing, and I find this among young people on the campus uh, that I teach at at Eastern, that uh, if they have a sense that what they bring to the table, even though it's half understanding, they're not going to be condemned, they're actually going to be drawn out. Uh, actually, the word educate um, is a Latin word taken uh, made anglicized, it means educare, means to draw out. We need to draw out what's inside of people. Uh, I once uh, at one presentation mentioned about BLM and the first response in the chat was it is racist. And rather than dismiss that, rather than disregard that, I asked, how about we go along a journey to find out how that person reached that conclusion? Why don't we have dialogue about what made them reach that final verdict? not condemn them, not dismiss them. So it, it almost is, uh, we have to go as Dr. King did, go, go far beyond what's fair and invite openness, invite dialogue and, and ask each other, can we learn from each other? And are we willing to? Uh, otherwise the walls go up so quick, we'll always be siloed off. Uh, and of course, when power is threatened, there's a big uh, iron wall sent up. But I think we can appeal to the better, hum, uh, better angels of human nature, as Abraham Lincoln would say, and invite open dialogue and a dialogue that we want to learn from each other. And not, is it right or wrong, but how did you get there? That's much more important than making moral judgments on people's statements. Mm. Yeah, that's so real. The, it, an expressed opinion or ideology is the tail end of a long biographical story. And so accessing those stories can be so much more meaningful. Um, Joanne, did you, uh, I saw your hand. I was hand. gonna say, and, and coming from a Jewess, uh, I think we need to uh, make use of the churches because I'm finding how, how strong their human rights um, ideology can be. There's a letter that was sent I don't know if it's come out yet in the paper from the Episcopal Diocese about the upcoming uh, white power rally in Coeur d'Alene and saying that the churches are against all of this. 
So I'm finding in working with the Interfaith Alliance, a lot of allies I didn't know we really had. And we shouldn't make this so just Jewish black. Let's include all the churches that want to be included. They want to be included. Yeah, thank you for that. Joanne, just to follow up, I see a, a question from Jeremy Press Taylor um, about the relationship between the LATA task force and Spokane Human's right, Human Rights Task Force. Um, is there a relationship? Could it be stronger? Could that be a, um, a path that we, we walk? Oh, how beautiful. Uh, back in the day when the Aryan Nations was marching, we created a Northwest uh, with Father Bill Wasmith. I don't know if you all remember him, created a um, coalition of all of the different task forces in the region uh, from Boundary County, Bonners Ferry, Leta, all around, and Spokane and Coeur d'Alene. Uh, it kind of, and we're a lot of us are still active, but the coalition itself kind of fell apart. And uh, it's our feeling in Moscow that it would be wonderful to revive it because, um, for example, we just had a letter that the task force wrote, but that 28 organizations in the region signed, and uh, including Temple Beth Shalom, for example. And uh, when something happens, we could all speak with one voice for one thing. We could share successes, what's working, like the ideas that uh, Professor Finney was just talking about of getting to the roots of things. Uh, we would like to revive that. And we're looking for ways of doing that. Wonderful. Hey, Joanne, I'm glad you mentioned that. I'm part of the North Idaho uh, Human Rights Consortium in Coeur d'Alene. And I'll, I'll pursue this idea. Why don't we revive that coalition? Thanks for bringing that up. Good. Yeah. There are so many um, comments and questions um, flowing in um, at this uh, in the chat, which is wonderful. And also a reminder that we, we of course can't touch on every issue and every iteration of this conversation. Um, and um, you know the connection that um, Joanne and Professor Finney are just making, it's, it's a reminder that this is on, ongoing work um, and that this is um, maybe not the first conversation, but maybe a first and the next iteration of conversations where we can keep um, engaging with one another, building solidarity, um, finding ways to have um, good productive conversations. Um, we didn't, uh, you know, we didn't solve the problem today, but I think we got, um, we, we have a solid foundation from, from this conversation. And so I do wanna um, thank all of you for, for being here again. Um, it was wonderful to hear your, your thoughts and your expertise. Um, and thank you for putting up with my incessant emailing and, and just being part of the process with me. It's been wonderful to, to get to know all of you and, and work with you. Um, I think maybe at that point, I'll, I'll thank all of our, um, questioners and apologize again that we couldn't get to all of these important issues that, that you're raising, but um, to say that, um, you know, to be continued, not, not goodbye. Um, and then um, I think I'm gonna pass it to, uh, is it um, Diana or Neil Schindler to say a final goodbye? I think both of us. Oh, yeah. good. <laughs> Diana, do you want to start or shall I? Sure, I'll kick it off, Neil, and then hand it to you if that's okay. Um, I just want to express my incredible gratitude to this amazing panel, um, uh, especially I know it's such a busy month for President Duncan and Dr. Finney with Black History Month and so appreciate you making time to be in dialogue and in community with the, with the Jewish community of Spokane. Um, and sorry, I'm the president of Congregation Emmanuel. Um, huge gratitude to Neil and to Steve and to Iris, Temple Beth Shalom and Jewish Family Services, and very much to uh, Dr. Mike Deland for making this happen. And I just wanted to share um, a few words from a prayer um, for our community, not my words, but from Rabbi Andrea Goldstein to close us out. Um, just a reminder that this is a continuing dialogue. May each of us come to understand that ultimately my experience of freedom, justice and peace is inextricably, inextricably linked to the freedom, justice and peace of every other person in our county and city, our country and our world. May we open our eyes to the invisible lines of connection that unite us and with clarity of vision continue to work for a world where every person's life is valued, cherished, and loved. 
So thank you so much for joining us um, and I'll hand it to Neil for any other final words. Thanks so much, Diana. Um, well, first of all, I wanna say that Jewish Family Services is so proud to have co-sponsored this event with Temple Beth Shalom and Congregation Emmanuel. I give so much credit to Mike and the wonderful panelists who put a lot of thought and effort and energy into this event. Um, I'm very glad to see so many households joining this morning. And as others have said, I'm very much hoping that this is the beginning of ongoing dialogue, outreach, connection, and solidarity. And even if it may not be appropriate to send out the chat to everyone who attended. I think we should at least hold on to it for reference for future dialogue and collaborative work. So thank you all for attending and for the panelists, especially for uh, making time and for making time and putting so much thought into this effort. Thank you again, everyone for being here. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. And the recording will be on the Temple website starting tomorrow, probably. Uh, have a wonderful day. And thank you so much, all of you, for joining us. And special thanks for all, for Mike Deland and the panelists. Bye. Thank you. Thanks so much. <laughs>